Again, good evening, and thank you all for attending this panel discussion. My name is Courtney Henderson, and I am the chair of the Women in NAACP Committee. I, along with my fabulous committee, who are in purple, <laughs> are happy to be here for our very first event of this year. We also want to thank you for uh, taking some time out of your evening to learn more about human trafficking and how we can prevent this. The first item that I would like to make uh, is we have refreshments. Please help yourself to all this wonderful food we have. I cannot take this home. I live by myself. <laughs> and I don't have the uh, fridge space for it. So please help yourself to refreshments in the back. I would also like to go over some housekeeping rules. I ask that you please silence or, or put your phone on vibrate so that we don't disrupt, uh, disrupt the panel discussion. And lastly, I ask that you hold all questions towards the end. I promise we will try to answer every question that we have. With that being said, I would like to give the floor to our wonderful moderator, who's also on the committee, Katrina huff Larman. Katrina huff Larman is currently serving her fourth term as town counselor in Randolph. She serves on the Ordinance and Business and Economic Development Subcommittees, where she works closely with the town manager to improve the town's economic growth. Councilor Huff Larman is, a, is the first woman of color to hold a town councilor seat in Randolph, and the first person of color, first woman of color, to serve as the vice president of the council. She considers herself the voice for those who are underrepresented and prides herself in developing social and employment opportunities for residents. Counselor Huff Larman is also an adjunct professor at Simmons University, Bridgewater State University, and Boston University, where she teaches courses on racism and oppression, social policy, urban leadership, and human behavior. She has dedicated her life's work to social justice and social change. She is the vice president of the Norfolk Plymouth County Area Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, an organization of college educated women committed to constructive development of its members and to the public service with the primary focus on the black community. She is also a board member of My, Lo My Life, My Choice and a board member of the Brockton NAACP. Katrina resides with her husband, Frank Larman, and her 15 year old son, Michael Larman. Please help me welcome our moderator, Katrina Luff. Thank you, thank you. My son is now 17. I don't know how I missed that. He's on his way out. Did you hear some pleasure in my voice about that? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone um, for coming out. Uh, this is such a, an important topic and definitely um, something I've been working with my life, my choice on um, since being a, a board member and, and, and realizing that the word is not out there. People do not know. So we need to do as much as we can to make sure that people are aware and not only in, you know, in, in Brockton, but other towns and cities. It's, if you know, now you, it's your job to inform others so we understand this is a public health issue, not just an individual issue. And I'll be talking about more about that as we go through. So thank you so much for coming out. Um, I will like to just mention that the president of the NAACP is here. Phyllis, will you please wave to us? Um, and Courtney mentioned the women who are on the board who pulled this together. Um, if you could just stand a little bit, just stand, not a little bit, just stand. <laughs> so this is the work that these fabulous ladies did today. So thank you so much. So let's get started. Um, there's so much to talk about and so little time as always. So I'll do a, a brief introduction of each panelist. And from there, we will get into the discussion. After discussion, we'll do a Q and A, um, and we see how it unfolds from there. Okay. Um, disclaimer: 
Detective William Williams uh, was pulled into this today because of his expertise and his knowledge. So he is not on the flyer, but he definitely has been um, able to do some great work around human trafficking. So the short um, that I have is Detective Williams from City of Boston. Um, he's been on the force for 26 years, um, and he's been doing um, he's been doing the Boston Police Human Traffic. He's been in the Boston Police Human Traffic Unit unit since 2020. Um, also, he's on the FBI Child Exploitation and Human Traffic Task Force, and he's been on that since 2020 as well. Um, Detective Williams, thank you so much for coming to share your expertise with us. Thank you for having me. Next, we have Detective Michael Tewitt has worked for the Randolph Police Department for 26 years, since 1997. In 2007, Detective Tewitt became a detective in the Street Crime Unit, where where there's a for, where there's a focus on gang violence and human trafficking. Since becoming a detective, he has used his policing skills to become familiar with human trafficking in the greater Boston area. In 2023, Detective Tua joined the FBI Human Traffic and Child Exploitation Task Force. Detective Tua has become a key player in understanding how human trafficking affects our community and determines to decrease sex exploitation. Detective Tewitt has also embraced community police and it understands the importance of developing a positive relationship with youth in the Randolph community. He often participates in community services, community services and educates youth on safety issues and, and, supports, and supports Randolph youth groups with their community service projects. Detective Tewitt has lived in Randolph for tw oh, 45 years um, where he started his public safety career. Thank you, Detective Tewitt. Thank you. Next, we have Democratic State Representative Michelle Dubois, grew up in, Bro in Brockton, graduated from Brockton Public Schools and receiving her bachelor's degree from the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts in North Adams. Representative Dubois' professional career centers on nonprofit administration and funding development for homeless shelters, female empowerment, youth sailing, and legal services. From, 25, from 2005 to 2015, Representative, Representative Dubois was Brockton's Ward 6 City Councilor and began serving as a state representative in Brockton from January 2015 to present. Representative Dubois focus in elected focus in her elected office on transparency, accountability, and good government that is driven by the needs and desires of the people living in the working class, urban, and diverse communities. Representative Dubois has led efforts successfully to support environmental justice movement in Brockton, support Brockton during the COVID epidemic and Brockton Public Schools. Some of the bills that Representative Dubois is currently working on that pertains to female empowerment is HD 392, termination of a parental rights when children are conceived during a rape situation, amending the mass hate crime law to include gender, as a protective class, and that is HD 2158. Um, and if you have any other questions uh, for Michelle, you could talk to her after to get her information. Thank you, Representative Thank you. Dubois. Thank you. Next, next, we have Audrey Morrissey, and she is the co-executive of My Life, My Choice. As a local and national leader in the field of exploitation, Ms. Morrissey has served as co-chair of the Victim Service Committee of Massachusetts Task Force on Human Trafficking. Ms. Morrissey has also served as primary consultant to the Massachusetts Administrative Office of the Trial Courts, redesigning the court's response to prostitution. Ms. Morrissey founded 
founded My Life, My Choice Survival Mentor Program in 2004, where she became the first survivor leader to mentor adolescent girls in Massachusetts. Ms. Morrissey serves as the primary na national trainer for My Life, My Choice, as well as coordinating My Life, My Cho Choice national leading efforts. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Morrissey. So now that we're done with these introductions, let's get this party started. <laughs> um, first, you know, I gave you a brief description of what each individual at, this, at the panel does. Um, I would like for each individual to at least tell us a little bit more about what you do and what is your connection to human trafficking and sex exploitation. Just a little brief of your connection, how you got into this, and, and uh, why you're so passionate about this. Um, let's start with Detective Williams. Uh, thank you. Uh, so as uh, Katrina stated, I transferred into this unit in 2020. Uh, previously, I was assigned to the Boston Police Homicide Unit for seven years. Uh, working there for, for some time, obviously, the schedule was uh, was pretty busy and demanding, so an opportunity uh, presented itself to, to come to a, a uh, I thought it was gonna be laid back because <laughs> as well as uh, Katrina said, you know, come, working in a major city for so long, I was really blinded to the fact that human trafficking was actually happening. So an opportunity opened up to um, go there for a Monday through Friday with weekends off. So I took that as, as a blessing coming out of homicide. Uh, for so long investigating murders in the city, uh, my victims didn't have a voice. So it's been a blessing to come here within our unit because I'm working daily with victims that have a voice, you know, or, or survivors that have a voice at, at that point. So that was really an eye opener to me and to realize that this was actually going on in our backyards, you know, uh, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our churches. So it, it took a, a real, uh, it was an eye opener for me and, and as well as uh, my boss transferred over there with me as well. So both of us, it's a learning process, uh, <clears throat> working in the FJC with My Life, My Choice on, on a daily basis with, with the survivors. Uh, it, it's definitely been rewarding to me because you're actually able to work with the survivors, you know, every day through their process. Mm -hmm. And you, you don't realize that the effect and the trauma that it has on them, but to see their progression and to understand that there's gonna be setbacks and there's gonna be you know, progression setbacks, but it's just a process. And to work along with uh, agencies and, and the uh, organizations that are there, it's just really so long, as Mike would tell you, we're used to doing our job on our own. You know, We go out and do the, the investigative part, but to see the whole holistic approach here is definitely a blessing. And 26 years on the job, I've, I've never seen anything like this, but it's a, it's a great opportunity for yeah. myself to be. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Detective Tewitt. Good evening, everyone. So, um, came from a small department. Again, I've been on 26 years. Um, our detective bureau, with a few people, um, we had a lot of cases. I originally was focused on the gangs, gang violence, youth violence. Um, as far as human trafficking, I, I picked up a case. Well, we started receiving complaints about a um, massage parlor in town. And um, my boss asked me to look into it. So I looked into it, started investigating it, ended up writing a couple search warrants, and they were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing out of the massage parlor. And I guess from that point on, I became a human trafficker. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you're in a small town, huh? <laughs> so so um, all of a sudden, as time went, we created an official human trafficking unit, um, which was me um, <laughs> and one of my supervisors. And since then, a few trainings. And I'll tell you something about the trainings, though. You learn a lot if you're not involved in human trafficking and, and basically know what to look for. And I could go back and pretty much say I've missed a lot of human trafficking victims in the past based on what I've learned investigating now. So 
it exists. If I, as a police officer, hadn't seen it for years, I'm pretty sure a lot of the public mm -hmm. hasn't noticed it. So right. um, that's something that um, now I understand. Um, as far as joining, I, I just recently, you said 23, but 22. <laughs> I joined the FBI task force, um, working with Anthony and a few others. They won't tell you, they kind of recruited me. I used to uh, work, do a lot of the gang stuff with a few of them. And uh, for a long time I kept saying, we don't have the resources to join the task force. So we don't have it. Um, we wear about six hats a piece, working as a detective in Randolph. And um, Anthony, uh, Mark Sullivan. I said, good. They said, just set us a, a meeting up with your chief. They sat down with the chief. Chief seen me about an hour later, says, I like it. You're part of the task force. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the advantage of being on a task force with different communities, I, I can't explain how much it works. Like, I'm always sending him a name. Are you familiar with this person? And that a lot of times, yes but we never noticed them in our jurisdiction. And uh, everyone knows Randolph is placed between two big cities, and sometimes we become the highlight for a lot of our mm -hmm. people. So, uh, hence now I'm a uh, human trafficking, one of my hats that I really like it. All right, thank you. Representative Dubois. Well, thank you, Katrina. Thank you, the members of NACP and President Phyllis Ellis for putting all this work together and all of you that are working in this, this sphere of protecting women and vulnerably exploited people. So I grew up in Brockton, uh, very poor, and living in Brockton, I don't know how many people would admit it, but most people that live in Brockton um, have some connection to prostitution, someone they knew, family member, friend, the, the struggles of being poor, um, realize themselves um, differently for um, women often, and that sometimes young girls feel as though there's no other way um, to make money. And then other times, young girls think that they're, they just didn't have a good home life, they don't have a good self-esteem, and they fall victim to these predators out to destroy them and monetize their bodies, and it's just so terrible. So growing up in Brockton, I've seen the realities of life, and therefore I have really gravitated toward work around um, people that are vulnerable, low-income people, women that have been exploited. I studied philosophy in college. I know people make fun of it, but it's done very good for me. And a lot of my study has been around um, um, female empowerment and bodily autonomy and that people are um, subjects and not objects to be bought and sold for sex of others. So that is just something that I'm extremely passionate about. It's really what's got me um, this far and I have a lot of women here in the room and on the television and in Brockton that fight domestic violence and this type of sex trafficking every day and it's just a scourge so i'm happy to be part of this panel and do whatever i can for the real advocates like aubrey and so many other people here um, to try to move that button forward for for residents thank you thank you thank you well, Hi, I, Ms. Audrey. Oh, yes, ahead, I ahead. will um, say that this was not work that I searched out to do, but I have been in the fe this field for 20 years, mm -hmm. and um, as a survivor of the commercial sex industry, um, a friend of mine who was also a survivor, who was in the life when I was in the life, um, asked me would I come and sit on a panel and kind of share uh, my experience being in the life. Um, and at that time, I was kind of struggling, and she was like, there's a little stipend. I said, okay, cool, you know. <laughs> um, and so um, I showed up, and that's where I met uh, Lisa Goldblatt Grace, who was the other executive director and co-founder of My Life, My Choice, at this training. and. Um, 
I just kind of, at that time back then, uh, we'd have a panel like this. It was very exploitive too. We'd have a panel and the survivors would just tell their stories. And, but at that time we needed to do that. You know, we understand today that survivors are more than just their stories. But I think the most powerful thing that happened for me was kind of uh, really learning what had happened to me, but the most powerful um, after training, and then I began running groups, and I began meeting the young people. And I, and I began hearing their stories. And then when I founded the mentoring program, and I began to have one-on-one -on -one relationships with these young people, um, you know, I grew up in a, um, I did grow up in Dorchester, but my parents owned a big, beautiful three-family home. Um, in those days, they were probably considered like a middle-class black family. And, um, and so I didn't know anything about being in programs and DC, you know, all that stuff. But I began uh, listening to these young people and um, through mentoring them, my passion just grew. Uh, just to see how resilient these young people were and sassy too. I mean, sometimes I, you know, the, you know, the relationship would be um, nurturing and loving, and then I gotta, you know, set them straight, you know. Um, but through meeting these young people, um, I couldn't even imagine. And I'm a mother of three daughters. I never wanted to work with girls. Girls are a pain in the butt. You heard me. Three daughters didn't want nothing to do with that. And I began to. Um, you know, meet these young people, and it was just like, oh my God. And um, they just motivated me. And even when I think back, my first three mentees, um, two of them are almost 33. I met them when they were 15 years old. Mm. Um, they're still in my life today. The first, my first mentee is 35, um, and they're still in my life today. And so it's that thing where, um, you know, you'll say, if I could just help one person. And so when I look at these three women who still check in with me before they make major life decisions, you know, um, that's what really gives me the passion because I can see the evidence of a few women, not just them, but the ones who are still in my life today. And I can see what I, I, I mean to them. And, uh, and that's what keeps me doing this work. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you for the introductions. Appreciate that. Um, let's get more into and having this conversation. And Audrey, let's start with you. Why is, important, why is it important to have these conversations and to inform the community of sex exploitation. So I, I want you to talk about that a little bit, but then I want you to have a subside and talk about communities of color and how the, it affects communities of color. Well, I'm going straight there. Okay, go ahead. Because uh, first of all, I'm, um, you know, thank everyone who's here, but this room should be filled yes. with yeah. people of color yeah. Yeah. in this community because what people do not get or understand that black and brown people are sold at an alarming rate. This is an issue that is in our community, even our, our um, LGBTQ brown folks, um, our LGBTQ trans women are even murdered at a much higher rate than white trans women. And so, um, you know, I think of you know, I've, I've been out of the life for, someone said that today uh, at the state house, I've been out for decades, and I thought, oh my God, you're old. Then I realized, you've been out for decades. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I think about our community uh, and where I grew up and um, how those things seem so cool, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, um, it was always in our face, you know, and I'm, I'm, I actually come from the era where you were on the street corners. It wasn't invisible like it is today. And so, um, you know, you have these privileged white women who, edu let, me, let me correct myself, educated privileged white women who say I sell my body because it's my choice. 
Well, of course, these women, I met one who said she only came out of the life to go to the London School of Economics. Well, that's not who I see. No. That is not who I see. I see most of the children that we serve at My Life, My Choice are children of color. Mm -hmm. And 80-something percent of the youth that we serve are part of our department and children's and families. Even our DCF um, has invaded the black homes and removing our children. And, and our children end up in these vulnerable situations that make it real easy for an exploiter to target them. So this is our issue. And so that's why we need to be talking about this because it's really, really real and it's our children and our women, black and brown people, again, who are targeted um, because of where they come from, lack of resources in state custody because our systems have come and moved them out of the black home. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, this room should be so packed um, with people from the community. And I will say that I used to partner um, with um, another a person who did a lot of um, work with the gangs. Um, and so we would do these presentations together and in the community in Boston, the black community, there were all these questions. Everyone was interested in the gangs. The gangs are pimping too. It all goes hand in hand, right? And so we have to be really mindful that this is a multi-billion, not million, billion dollar industry. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Dubois, tell us is we heard from Audrey, we heard from the detectives. This is a huge issue, more so. And we heard from you. You like, you know, if growing up in Brockton, I had some sort of interacting interaction directly, indirectly, uh, with folks. What does the state house know about this? Uh, what is their knowledge? Uh, and we'll get into later, maybe you know what type of bills are available. But right now, just tell us. Are they as familiar with this issue as they should be? Well, what is it? It's a, it's a, it's a job as old as time, they say, to try to mm -hmm. make everybody feel like there's no way to stop, you know, the selling of human bodies. So they may, they, you know, so there's this, there's this parable or whatever it is about prostitution as just being um, regular. So it kind of trickles back to what the detective talked about, is that like, you don't even really know what human trafficking is when you're walking around in your own body. You don't know that um, this person that is being, you know, given to this other person for sex in order that they can get heroin is actually being sex trafficked there. And you don't, you really think maybe they're just drug addicts. And so you, you forget the real humanity of things. So I think that people at the State House care about the topic and they understand it at maybe, and I think they understand, they're super smart. So I'm not saying that they can't understand it, but there is an education around the details of what is human trafficking mm -hmm. and how we can address it and just generally bills that are passed at the state house that purport to protect women and by intention try to protect women often in the negotiation um, meat grinder come out um, with negatives like the 2014 domestic violence law that has empowered some police stations and restricted some police stations from giving data around domestic violence and um, those types of things. So it's just, um, it's like I think they know what it is when you're talking high level stuff. When you're talking um, on the street stuff, I think a lot of the people I'm elected with never come into that in mm -hmm. their real day to day life. So they're doing a lot of academic reading about what it is. And sometimes those academic solutions turn around and get perverted by the capitalistic system that's set up to manipulate bureaucratic regulation to actually hurt the victim. 
So I think that the State House has um, a, a sense of what it is. They care about it. There are quite a few bills that are pending that are positive about it, but I worry about the details of um, just blanket, let's make the sale of humans, you know, legal um, talking point that some progressive and quite liberal lawmakers, and I'm a, a super liberal lawmaker, fall into. So it's like they've gone so far to the left that they're popping up on the other side with the Republicans. And like, so it, it's complicated, especially yeah. when we're talking about human freedoms and there is a lot of racism in it. And there is a lot of, um, you know, not caring about people because they're brown or caring about people because they're super poor. And um, it's a lot of layers. And then even the legislators that take it on um, typically are from um, communities that struggle with these types of um, options for our young women, that um, they don't really struggle with that when in their community. So they look at their dog, like in their fate. It's complicated. It's no. a lot of work. I'm happy to be here and uh, to work on it. But a lot of people in the community know much more about it than I do. But it is, it's very complicated. And I encourage everybody at home to pay attention because there is legislation pending and we really don't want anything passed that is going to hurt women. So be careful. Yes, yes. And we want to touch on that a little bit. But you're right. It is complicated. I'm a believer that you only know what you know. Right? And if you, not, if you have never had that experience then you have to do your work to understand the, the process. So I, I understand there's so many layers, I get that. Um, but that's why these forms are so important and that's why these forms need to happen, in my opinion, in every town and city in Massachusetts and beyond. Uh, let me ask, ask the uh, detectives, what has been your experience in um, sex, um, working, human trafficking, what have some of your experience, you told us why you are in this business, what have you experienced um, in this area? Uh, basically it was touched on um, when we were talking about what, what drives this in the, in the inner city. Mm -hmm. Boston's, Boston's a major city. Uh, well, I worked in the gang unit previously in my career too. And um, that's, that's what's driving it. So that was our focus when we came to this unit. We wanted to identify a lot of the key impact players in these games that were profiting off of the exploitation of, of, of the youth. <clears throat> and that's why our focus was coming here. And it starts with, with us and, and, and myself. We reached out to Mike with, with educating ourselves first. Right. Uh, when I came here, um, when you think about human trafficking, you think about you know the, those commercials you would see with someone chained to a bed or, you know, in the basement where, the, where, where they can't see light, someone that's not eating. So although that's happening in places, but, it, but, but to realize that, you know, you can be in the grocery store and that young lady or young boy right beside you can be exploited. Uh -huh. So it's all about education. So what we did in our unit, and, and what we, we were blessed because we came to a small unit and we came in there to, to, together, new, like, like on, a, on an even slate. So we went out, we did trainings, we traveled to Phoenix, uh, we did a lot of trainings in Dallas, Arizona, so we saw what other agencies were doing. And it's basically educating yourself. So uh, we put together um, <clears throat> an educational platform where we go out and speak to the community and help them understand what the signs are. We go to hotels, we work with the hotel staffs and help them understand that these people that have been staying in your hotel for weeks on end aren't the average uh, customers or residents in your hotel. So. By doing our part with educating people and getting out there to speak to them, I think it's opening up, opening up everyone's eyes to what's really going on around them. Mm -hmm. uh, working with the youth is huge, and the youth survivors is unbelievable. A lot of our uh, work that comes to our unit is coming through 51As that are coming through DCF. And the amount of these mm -hmm. cases that we get daily is, 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 is mind-boggling. So our job to come in, Mike, Mike, Mike's a black officer, young black officer, they, they look at it and we want to break that stereotypical uh, barrier between law enforcement and our survivors. Because we all know at first dealing with the police just generally isn't easy. But imagine dealing with a, a, a young survivor or a survivor period that has been uh, traumatized so long and these trust issues are already embedded in them. 
So how do we break down that? So we had to educate ourselves as well. We don't work with uh, any paraphernalia on us that, that says Boston Police. We drive all unmarked cars. So our approach is a lot different. We're out there daily in these streets, right? We, we, we deal with uh, the survivors daily uh, on a name-to-name -name basis because we have to get to know them in order for them to trust us. And that's huge. Trust is very huge when you're dealing with these survivors because they have been manipulated so long. So how do we gain their trust? Mm -hmm. We have it stacked up against us anyway because we're law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And coming from where I came from, my background, I've been in the gang unit, fugitive unit, homicide. It was always an enforcement role. You know, somebody did something, somebody's got to go to jail. When I came here, I had to take a step back and really, like you said, you got to peel back layers and understand what's the real problem here, right? It's the real problem. We go to some states and, and they, they, they arrest the, 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 the women out in the streets, you know? They arrest the males out in the streets, both ways. Massachusetts, we don't do that. So when I came here, it's like, how do we solve a problem one way w w without addressing it on both ends? But when I realized the services that are involved uh, w w with trying to get these survivors to a place where they're ready to accept these services. Everybody's not going to be ready. Just because you go to somebody and say, hey, I have these services lined up for you right now. I have a bed for you. I have food for you. I have a way to out. We have a safe house for you. If they're not ready, they're not ready. But Absolutely. you have to be able to accept that. You know, like, you can't say, take it personal. I'm giving you all this, but you're not taking it. You know, they're not ready to take it right now, but you can't give up on them. So that was us. We had to educate ourselves and understand that and take a step back from the enforcement role and kind of be a supportive role and understand that it's going to take us, it's going to take my life, my choice, it's going to take D. Kennedy, it's going to take everyone in this panel to help this situation. Absolutely. Let me ask um, Detective Tewitt, um, how has the police grown? What are some of the practices to inform the public of some of how to keep themselves safe, those who are in the life? So... <clears throat> I'll answer that. I'm just going to also add a few comments on some of the things I had. I have mentioned the gangs, and a lot of times, my pot, when I was in the gang unit, you had your gangs, you had your gang violence, you had your drugs. Now you have, and pretty much it was kind of easy to deal with the gang kids. If you get a weapon off of them, you go lock them up. You get drugs off of them, a lot of gang kids were dealing drugs. You lock them up, you have the drugs. It's, it's a lot different with the human trafficking aspect of things. Um, it's, it's a little more investigative. You, you, you kind of need the product on board with you as, as an easy way to say it, or else, or else people walk every day. So um, He mentioned the plain clothes thing. Randolph is, I believe, the most diverse community in Massachusetts. Probably New England. Um, you talk about the communication between the police and the public, things aren't always great. <laughs> Again, we do a lot of enforcement, so on. Um, <clears throat> our department, I believe since 2008, our hiring has been 75% minority since then. So, so we're growing. I mentioned that because I feel it's, it's better if you have a, let's say, a Cape Verdean speaking officer speaking to Cape Verdean youths or parents and families. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Haitian. I think there's a little more of a bond. So um, in a lot of communities, you have to look at the dynamics between the police department when it comes to their race and the community that they're serving. Mm -hmm. and, and the bond that you can try to form. And do that, you obtain information and you're able to work a little better on what, what your outcome is. Um, as far as outreach, um, we have two major hotels in Randolph. We have issues at both of the hotels. Um, again, the public may not know, even the hotel staff may not know. I pretty much, I make sure I go and I I'm pretty much the liaison between the hotels and a lot of our businesses in town. So I go into the hotels, I speak to the staff, and I, I have them look for what we look for. And, and a lot of times I'll get a call, hey, we have this adult male who dropped off two teenage girls, and so on. So now 
now we can look into it. Without that bond, the girls could have been in the room for months. And, and right. we don't know. So, so the outreach to the community and so on. We have um, a school resource officer that teaches in the schools. She touches upon it with her students. Um, we have um, on our website, department website, we have information that if you see human trafficking, you can report it to us and so on. Um, the other thing is teaching our own officers what to look for. As I mentioned before, I was a detective and went to training. I never, I look back and I, I pretty much 90% say this girl was being trafficked. And, and, and now I look back and I'm like, there's all the signs, there's all the signals, but you never know that unless you are made aware of it. The, I touched upon it, the task force um, thing works because Randolph, where I work, may not have a lot of resources. <clears throat> but so whenever, if I need something, when I say resources, let's say I have a situation I want to investigate, I might not have the bodies. Mm. Okay, There might not be um, funding for overtime, mm. which it takes because mm. Human trafficking doesn't go on the nine to five schedule. That's right. You know what I mean. So, so I reach out to the unit, and they they come over and they help me out. I go over, I help them out. So now, when you're teaming up with other potential units, and I don't mean just law enforcement, DCF. I mean, there's so much out there that can help you and get information from to help us now work these cases that now it just doesn't end right here and. Nothing's done, there's no arrests, or we haven't right. saved anybody. So. Right. So let me get into this because you, you, you said you touched on something that's really interesting when you talk about this is not a nine to five, right? And um, so not only do we need the detectives out there, you know, making sure that the keeping individuals safe. Uh, we need legis legislation out there keeping um, in place to take care of the sy sy systemic issues. But we also need agencies like My Life, My Choice, who are coming up with models and who have ideas of how to keep the um, community safe. What have you, what has My Life, My Choice, What what is their brand of um, and their idea of how to keep the community safe, how to keep um, um, individuals off out of the life and into a, a, a better lifestyle. Well, that comes that goes services, and you need money for services. And so, one of the um, things that we're supporting, and and I'm a co-chair, is the um, Emma Bill, which um, decriminalizes people involved in the life, but still criminalize the buyers, the pimps, the brothel owners, and provide more services. Um, we know that, um, I, I can, basically I can use myself for an example, when I was in the life there were no services, mm -hmm. right? And so, Anytime um, I even thought, I don't want to do this anymore, I had no way to, no way to turn. Right. right. Um, I come from like the old school, the combat zone. Um, if you were on the street corners, um, I remember a van would go around and it would pass out condoms to the prostitutes right. uh, because we don't want you all to infect those upper middle class white men who oh. are driving into... Um, driving into the combat zone, um, and we don't want them to infect their wives. Um, and so that was the extent of, right? Uh, someone handed you condoms, that was, right? But it, it, and in that case, it wasn't for your safety, it was for the safety of the buyers. Um, and so the other piece is, we work with adolescent youth, but a couple of other, uh, Nikki Bell, who, runs um, Lyft in Worcester, who has a house for um, adult women with mental health, substance abuse, and prostitution. Um, 
and the Eva Center that Sherry Hernandez runs, um, which is a, a shelter. Uh, again, it goes to services, places that survivors can go to to be safe, um, places where they can go to learn how to live again. Because you don't just come out of that, particularly if you've been, uh, myself as an example, from a teenager to like 30 years old, and you kind of touched on it. I know by the end of my road, when people pass by me, they just saw a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. I know no one ever rolled past me at that time and said, I bet that poor woman was right. recruited into life as a teenager, and this is the end result, mm -hmm. right? Um, the dehumanized, right? You have to dehumanize people. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have to help people to regain their dignity. Because when I begin to feel good about myself and, you, and I learned how to live again, then I had a, the ability to keep myself safe, to keep myself out of you know, harm's way. I'm not entering places that I know will cause harm to me. But I had to be taught that. And, um, and unfortunately for me, there were no services. You know, for me, it was a 12-step program that taught me you know, how to live. And so when you talk safety, um, you have to have safe places for the youth to go. You have to have safe places for the adults to go. Um, and some of these exploiters are real dangerous, real dangerous. I remember, and I, I also want to add that I also run groups in, in two adult facilities. And um, I remember one woman, she had just gotten there and she came to the group and her leg just kept jumping up and down, jump, right? And I go there like every Thursday. It took like a month and a half of me going there every week before her legs stopped jumping. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm talking about like the fear of, you know, he might find me. Mm -hmm. And so, like anything else, um, we need the funding and the resources in all areas for, for um, victims of trafficking and survivors to go to be safe. Because a lot of times they run back to their traffickers because there's not enough. That's all they know. That, yeah, and, but there's not, there's, where do Nothing I go? Else, right? If you only have a few facilities, most of them are always full. Right. So where do I go? And so with the Emma Bill, that's what we're pushing um, more services. And I also want to be real clear because I know that with all this prison reform stuff, you know, everybody wants to like legalize everything. I mean, the Ooh. weed is legalized, Ooh. you know, it's this whole thing. I want you to be real clear. Mm. I think that most people, when they hear full decrim, I know for myself, I mean, that's a waste of a jail cell to throw someone involved in prostitution. It's just a waste of time in it. <clears throat> Full decrim means legalizing pimping, legalizing brothels, legalizing buying. Could, if you could think of, think of Massachusetts, a major city, legalizing prostitution, it would become a tourist, a sex industry tourist destination. Drugs are gonna go through the roof. Crime is gonna go through the roof. There is no cutesy way to sell people. Mm. I'll vote against it. I really, I just am against <laughs> it. And then if it becomes legal, I don't know what I'll do. I'll yeah, but, it, but there's, no, there's no cutesy it's way. It's not a cutesy way to sell no. people. And for me, I'm gonna say this over and over again as a black woman, mm -hmm. I am here yelling and screaming about my black and brown children mm -hmm. and women who will pay the ultimate price. And I don't know about you, but in my lifetime, I can't imagine giving white men permission to buy black and brown bodies. That's very disturbing for me. It's very disturbing. Oh, can I, can I touch on that as well because you're talking about your children and you're talking about buying black and brown children could you tell us um you said black and brown 
individuals mm -hmm. are going at high rates. Mm -hmm. But you didn't say anything about the black and brown children. Are they the highest, um, um, be, are they being sold at the, uh, at the highest on the market? Um, Tell us a little bit well, more yeah, about more, the black and yeah, brown well, children. You're more vulnerable when you're a kid. You're, more, right. you're, you're much more vulnerable. It doesn't even matter what race you are, right? You're, you're more um, vulnerable. It's easy to impress you, particularly if you don't have anything. Mm -hmm. And you have this exploiter that can buy you those cell phones, those right. sneakers, those outfits, right. and all of that stuff that a lot of our black and brown children don't have access to, right? Mm -hmm. That stuff looks shiny and nice. Listen, I've always been addicted to shiny things. Right. <laughs> always. You know what I'm saying? I like nice stuff. If I see something nice today, I'm like, right? Right? I zoom right in. And I remember back in the day riding through the combat zone, and I remember back then, the girls and the women they had on fur coats, they were shy, I, they were, right. and I'm just like, wow. Now my family, again, I didn't come from poverty, but I come from that home, my mother wasn't buying all, everything I wanted, you know what I'm saying? And so those things look good to me, you know what I'm saying? And so when our, our kids are coming from a place where a single parent, mom can't afford all those things, and Mr. Wonderful comes along, or even Miss Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Let's keep that 100. Right. Even Miss Wonderful. Right. Right? Um, it just puts our children at high risk. And another thing, too, that I, I, I want to touch on, because I don't want to, again, our LGBTQ mm -hmm. brown youth who have been put out of the home. Yeah you know, because their parents can't accept them for who they are, for their, their identities. And so that makes that population of brown kids very vulnerable, right? Because there's other um, kids who are gonna show you, this is how we survive out there. That's right. This is what we do, right? And then what happens, then you get um, these people are so crafty, the sex worker folks are so crafty, they even have our brown LGBTQ youth, our trans youth saying, this is what we want to do. Right. Mm. I know, I don't care who you are, if our society wasn't so prejudiced against people, if everyone could get equal education, equal housing, and our trans people, they health care, they were treated in so many ways that if these things were easy for them to ob obtain, their choice would not be to sell themselves. There's no way anyone who has what they need would think, this is what I want to do. And I also want to say, and keep this 100, that it is still upper middle class white men buying our trans youth, buying our brown gay boys, buying our trans girls and our trans women, right? So we're all targeted, no matter where, what walk of life or how we identify, um, people target us, it's so the most vulnerable population. The, the oppressed group is definitely targeted. And one more question before we go to the audience. Michelle and uh, Representative, um, in, in hearing all of this, you mentioned earlier, bills are being worked on. Is there anything you want to share with us about what's being worked on in the State House currently? Well, maybe Aubrey, she touched Audrey. on, Audrey, please forgive me, Audrey, I'm so sorry. Audrey um, touched on the bill that she's been working on, which is, is like, I learned about it today at a, a bill um, information session, and it really seems um, really well intended, and I, and so um, there's a lot happening that maybe our, um, that she could speak about. Um, I, I really, I, I am very cautious about this topic because I just 
don't want to be drawn into anything that might wind up hurting people. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be. In, I just want to make sure that any bill that gets passed isn't used as a tool mm -hmm. to no longer look to the young girl who's selling herself mm -hmm. because it's legal, and then mm -hmm. um, you know the predators have you know, free reign over our most vulnerable people. So I don't, I, I, I'm one, I'm looking for a bill that's gonna, um, we have these wonderful detectives here that, you know, freely work on this, but I, I want the bill to more or less spell out how the police are gonna be required mm -hmm. to focus on arresting um, Johns and traffickers mm -hmm. and not ignore mm -hmm. the women who are selling themselves because it's no longer an arrestable offense. So once we can figure out how to do that, I'll be on board, but I am opposed to making prostitution legal because I do not believe human bodies should be sold. And it's Thank just you. basic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just to touch on that, what's frustrating, uh, we, we travel throughout Massachusetts anywhere, and uh, we, we can conduct operations to uh, do a proactive enforcement. But there, there's there's uh, counties within Massachusetts that won't prosecute the Jones. Right. Mm -hmm. So that that's frustrating mm -hmm. in, in itself. Uh, mm -hmm. We've we've done them uh, several. We came out and helped Mike out with, with the huge operation uh, mm -hmm. with, with over uh, seven arrests. And, and there, there's counties that refuse to prosecute uh, a, a sex for a fee crime. So if they're refusing to do that, you're letting them know that it's okay to come into our county yeah. mm -hmm. and exploit these young women, that's young right. boys, young girls, that's your right. neighbors. So that's, right. that's where it's gotta start at. You can't enforce it, enforce it in one county and cross the street and you're in a different different right. county and, and not enforce it. So that gets frustrating for, for us as law enforcement. If, if we're gonna do this, we have to do it across the table. And, and there's different reasons why we believe these counties aren't doing it. I mean, you know, they, they, there are, it, it, it's in the books. Like, how are you going to um, prosecute drinking in public, but, but, but you're not going to prosecute uh, sex for a fee? So it, Absolutely. It, it, Thank it you for sharing much. that with us, because I think that's really important. We have to do it across the board. We can't pick and choose and favor mm -hmm. um, certain parts of the state. We're at Can the I just say one last thing about that, and that's, that's privilege. Right? Okay. Right. Right. Again, that's white privilege, yes. um, and it and it's not that I'm gonna bash law enforcement, but when you have white police officers, middle right, middle class, and the, their neighbors, right? I remember they would say, "What are you doing with her? Go home to your family." You know what I mean? So privilege plays out here as well. Not that mm -hmm. they're bad cops, but they're their peers. Mm -hmm. right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, yeah. it's, out, it's outside of the officer's hand at that point where it gets to the judicial line. Mm -hmm. If we make the arrest in the street, it, it's out of our hand once it gets to the court where they're refusing to prosecute. prosecute. So the arrests are being made within. And, 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 and I think it's all about education as a whole, whether it's white, black, right. Hispanic, you know, police officers, it's about education and understanding what's going on out there. And it needs to be enforced mm -hmm. holistically, yes. like throughout the department, throughout the community, everybody's got to play a part. Mm -hmm. We can't bring somebody to the table and you don't hold them accountable yeah, because what, what message are you showing there? So no. the detective is offering another, um, in my opinion, another area of the bill that we should amend mm -hmm. and put some direction to our DAs yes. as yes. well mm -hmm. if we're going to pass mm -hmm. this law. Right. That we're going to have the police yep. hi right. arrest the Johns, right. help the prostitutes, the people being prostitutes get out of that life, mm -hmm. and the DAs are going to prosecute yeah. in some direction yeah. as much as we can. Yeah, because if you don't, if you don't, if people don't wouldn't buy people, you wouldn't be able to sell people. Right, right, right. If it, if it wasn't a this business, if it wasn't a business, let's give people in the audience, you know, just a couple of uh, uh, option to ask questions. Just a couple of questions. Really want to make sure that we are uh, you're, you're hearing everything you need to hear. Yes. Hi. Um, so you all touched on a couple things. You you talked about DCF. Um, so one of the things that I find in working with young people is they go into the system to no fault of their own, but they are penalized. They are criminalized. Um, you said, you know, they get pulled out of these homes. A five-year-old did not ask to get pulled out of their home, right? 
They didn't ask for that, but they go into the system and now you're that little, you know, and it's not okay. But now these kids have, they're growing up. They don't stay five forever. They're 10. And now they're 10 with a major ship on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. Then they're 15 and they're six feet tall and they are already looked at as a threat. They go into school, they're a threat. Um, so how do, we, how do we mitigate some of that, number one? Um, number two, I'm, I'm sorry, I have a few questions here. Um, speaking of schools, um, schools need to have a more open conversation with these kids younger. Um, I have, working in the school system before, I have brought condoms to school and given them to children because I've had a child tell me she had a gangbang. She was 12. Um, I'm sorry. This is a problem. It's a problem with 10-year-olds in our school system right now here in Brockton, today. Right now, as we speak, because I don't know how many seconds it is, but there's a child being hurt right this minute. Somebody you know, there's a neighbor who is doing something that they shouldn't be doing, that child is not theirs. You can feel it in your bones every time you walk by that house. It's not being nosy, it's being careful. Right. It's being a good person. It, it's being that, that, that society that we used to have when we had the mentality where we had a village. That's right. what that is. You know, I remember the combat zone. I have people that had to go through there. And then, you know, now it's Tremont Street, it's all pretty, and it's, it's, and it's Chinatown, and it's lovely, right? But I remember going to certain doctor's offices down there, and, and if you left late, if you got out of the hospital late, and they were in fur coats and underwear, you knew exactly what you were dealing with. Now, they're online, that right? Totally Your kids are playing video games. Uh, your parents don't even understand the languages that kids are speaking now. Oh, no cap, no this, whatever, whatever. Right. Do you know what that means? No, you don't. You have no idea what your children are talking about. You have no idea who your children are talking to. But okay, let it happen. Let that TV, let the, let the phone be the babysitter. Mm -hmm. If you're 16 and you live in my house and I pay for your phone, guess what I'm doing? I'm going through your phone. If you have a password, it's my password now, boo-boo. We are all sharing this password today. Parents <laughs> right. need to do better. School needs to do better. Right. The police needs to do better. We, we need to have more open conversations. I've known Mike, I, I think, since he became a police officer. Um, I think, I think before. That was a long time. But. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I'm only 25, so I was a baby then. But, um, he, I will say, he's always been that officer that I know people could go to. Not every police officer is like that. Right. I mean, and we've, we, the past week has shown that, right? However, we need to have, we need to have a, a communication system where the kids and the lawmakers and the, the people on the ground are all coming together because if not, it's not going to work. And that's why this forum exists today to educate individuals. Thank well, you so DCF much. Well, DCF is broken. Yep. And oh, um, yep. the oh. one thing, I, and I'm going to leave that to the other folks to answer, oh. but there is a bill at the State House for a uh, sex ed curriculum, and it has been filed many sessions, and it got out of committee last session, and anybody at home who has a child, having your kid have a curriculum that's been approved and is emotionally and um, age appropriate for your child to know so they can identify if they're being abused is a good thing. So um, support that bill, hopefully, if you talk to a legislator. Yeah, it's called calling a, a vagina a cookie or a vulva right. a cookie. That's no. Right, well, that's no. a problem, yeah. So we have another question over here. Hi, first of all, I wanna say thank you for being here. I'm learning a lot um, just by listening to you all. Um, but I did have a question going back to the state house so how can we work with the state house to make them more in touch with human trafficking since they aren't trying to take care of us on our level well again i'm going to say audrey is working with this group called the emma uh, emma, emma Project, coalition emma coalition yeah. and maybe she can just talk about yeah. that for a minute yeah so today um we did a, a informational session um 
two other survivors who are co-chairs of this bill, myself, spoke, and then we did some lobbying, knocking on doors, and really, um, you know, educating people um, from a survivor's perspective. Audrey, how could people at home get in contact with the Emma Coalition or your organization? Um, well, My Life, My Choice, um, you can Google My Life, My Choice, and um, our organization will come up. Um, and the Emma Coalition, you can go online and, and look us up. The page should be active, so if you wanted to get more active. But to your question, we have to keep going to the State House. I, I can't even keep a shoe on. I walk so much today, <laughs> right? I'm like, oh God, my feet hurt. But that's what it takes. And what I've learned from another representative, not what from a representative's aide was, people don't really care about like the statistics that 80%, you know, you're reading all that. People want to hear when you go in the state house, the real stories, you know, the people who were affected um, by this. And so that's what, that's what we're doing. You know, I brought a lot of my staff and my life, my choice as a whole, uh, just hired uh, a policy manager. And so the Emma bill is just a, you know, a bill that we support, um, but we will be filing um, particularly around um, juvenile justice um, because we work with youth. Uh, we will be, I think the state house will become, will become more familiar than we ever have with the state house. And My Life, My Choice alone has at least 15 survivors on staff. And so a couple of uh, survivors um, went with me today and they had the opportunity to, to speak and we talked about bringing more and educating our staff and finding out where our survivors um, feel that they can be most powerful um, in the state house. And we so this young there. person could email your yes. work and, I and, my, and my, I my life, my choice, yeah. or people at home could and then they would be connected to future yes, stuff yeah, that way. Yeah. And anybody can email me too and I will get you in contact with these folks so we can build that coalition. Indeed. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you. We have another question. Oh yes, my name is Renita Peters. I, um, I work for Brockton Neighborhood Health Center as a case manager, but I'm an activist for domestic violence and sexual assault here in Brockton. I worked so she many years in domestic job. violence and sexual assault field, and I really appreciate training like this. I took a lot of human traffic, but my question is, what can we community leaders, professionals do to help? Because I work in a clinic that I'm pretty sure that I saw something that I'm thinking, okay, this, is, this doesn't look good. And you know, we work close to the shelter, and you see this in Brockton all the time, but what can we profession, what can we do as a community leaders, as a professional? It feels like I wanted to say, what kind of signs should we look for? That should we have more trainings like this? I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about, you know, telling people from the Brockton neighborhood to invite you guys to give us a training, mm -hmm. because these are very concerning for us. And as an immigrant woman, I know my community suffer a lot with that. I'm k and I'm pretty sure that I see that with the Brazilians, k -Verdans. You know, you name it, we can see it. I think I'm looking more for what else can I do? So, so on, on the educational standpoint, you can contact us. We'll come out and do a presentation. Um, it, and it's catered to what, whatever you have going on, whether it's the office, whether it's students, whether it's you know, a room full of a mixed crowd. We want to come out and, and help you identify what's going to help you identify. Yes. You know, and, and, it, and there's no blueprint to this. You know, we can't say every time you see this, this is what it's going to be. But if it raises your eyebrow, it's enough to be concerned, then you should probably reach out to us. Um, Mike's out here, he, he's closer. Um, like I said, the, the Federal Task Force gives us the opportunity to go anywhere we need to go. But we will come out and we will do educational uh, PowerPoints, we'll hold meetings. But th that's the way we're going to be able to combat this on a, on a, on a broader approach, approach, is by education. So if you, if you need to reach out to us, we can leave our numbers with you and we'll, we'll definitely come out and uh, assist with that. So, so and my for, life, for, my choice has a training team as well. Yeah. And so we will come out as well and we have done that. I think that 
um, health care centers, emergency room personnel, they all need a good training. And so we offer that as well. And before you had asked that question, I had to jot it down a few things that I thought were time limited, but I thought we might be able to squeeze in, and that was how to report. Yes, mm. please. Of course, there's a bunch of ways to mm. report them. Mm. Uh, another thing we haven't talked about for the public and signs to look for, yeah. how you can, yeah. signs that you can look for to determine that someone may be being trafficking. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I think we touched upon it briefly, but social media is huge when, yeah. when she mentioned going yeah. to the phone. Mm. A lot of uh, juveniles are being picked up on social media. Yeah. Yes. All right, and, and that's huge. That's, that's very, they're very vulnerable on social media, whether it's through fake accounts, mm -hmm. adults acting as children, and so on. Yeah. All right, so that's, I mm. mean, we could go on for days, there's mm. a lot. Mm. Um, I just want to, I feel that like we didn't answer some of your questions Yeah, like how do you beginning. record it and what are the signs? Oh, no, I mean. Yeah. But, so I, I just want to touch upon a, a police aspect when it comes to, especially the juveniles. And what's frustrating to me, and I can, I'll throw towards legis legislation, is um, I could come across a 15-year-old girl who, in my opinion, might be trafficked. Our juvenile laws sometimes they limit us mm. so much mm. as to what we can do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and and we talk we talk about that's where some of the mm -hmm. other assistance come in. But if a 15 year old girl I believe is being trafficked and mm -hmm. doesn't want to talk to me, mm -hmm. e even and we talk about the bond that they may have with their well, go back combat the zone they yeah. pimped yeah, the <laughs> exploiters. Yeah. The, the exploiters. Um, our first goal is to separate them from that person. Yeah. Okay. Once we get them away from that per person, mm -hmm. now everything else we try to funnel in, and every resource has to be there because anywhere along that chain that's broken, back to the exploiter. Right. And um, if there was some legislation that can say if we can determine that this child is in danger enough where my hands are tied with the exploiters up in the hotel room and I have her in the lobby mm -hmm. and I can't keep them separated, yep. it's a wrap. we lose right there. It's a wrap. So if, if, if there was a way where we could just keep them apart long enough to get someone there, service, whatever it is, to keep them on that path out would be great. Other than that, we can't detain them. And tell me if I'm wrong. No. But we can't detain them. We can't, obviously, they're, they're, to us, they're victims, and we can't put hands on them or anything like that. And what our goal is to help this person, but mm -hmm. we are so limited in what we can do. We, we've done a little tricks, like if we hear the right things, okay, we, maybe a section or something like that, okay, evaluation. We, uh, we now have a clinician mm -hmm. at the Randolph mm -hmm. Police Department. Maybe have her come down. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the communication between them is a lot better, depending on who you deal with. And she might, or he might be able to say, "All right, give me, come with me for 24 hours. Let's work on this." Mm -hmm. And and at least you got, you have them separated. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a major wall. Just getting them away, because that bond is so tight, as you mentioned. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, just, like you say, like the domestic violence, so on, so on. Because that is, that person is what they know to be the person that takes care of them. And that's the person to go back to. Do we have another question on here? Thank you so much, guys, um, for um, just illuminating, shining a light on this issue. You were just talking, officer, about a 15-year-old and the, the challenges of separating. And in my mind, I'm thinking about this is a minor mm -hmm. who, and I know, like, you know, I was like, they're minors. Like, how, how are you going to say that, yes, I know this person is upstairs. I know that something is going on that's not supposed to be going on. Like, who is protecting this minor? 
like, and I, I don't know, and um, <laughs> my sister here was like, well, it could, it could very well be a family member that's involved in all of it. So like, there are no protections, right? Um, so like, all of it is quite disturbing. What I'm thinking about the entire time, um, I've been thinking about my 13 year old daughter and I've been thinking about my nieces and I've been thinking about my nephews and I've been thinking about, and nobody has mentioned so far that I've heard about um, how this is affecting, um, I mean, it's affecting everybody, but what are the rates of, you know, male um, children, minors, being involved um so i'd love to hear about that but in thinking about all of those people i'm thinking about what are we doing um from a legislative perspective um to work on prevention and i know prevention is is hard like it, you know i'm a physician so i know that you know if someone has x x and x most likely you know this is the diagnosis right and it sounds to me like there is no definitive signs are there some but they're not definitive and it's really hard to sort of pinpoint and say no this is exactly what's going on but what can we do um, from a le legislative perspective, I think from an education perspective, I think there are a lot of parents that are absolutely clueless. You are absolutely right when you're talking about just even how to manage technology with your child. Nobody knows how to do that, like in a real way. And I know because I have a crafty 13 year old that knows how to get around parental yeah. controls. Yeah. And so all of a sudden I'm becoming a tech savant like trying to figure out like how to make things safe proof but i it, it just feels like there needs to be education from a parenting um level um from a school perspective and and these things need to be not just like a one-off community meeting like this it needs to be almost like part of the curriculum in a school setting where parents have to come children have to come like all of that to like get the word out because these little silos and trying to get educated in um in these settings are good but i feel as though the masses are still in the dark like i just was mm -hmm. <laughs> well just to touch on boys this does happen to boys what we find is that um, boys are less likely to have exploiters and a lot of the boys who might be living on the street because they're gay or what have you um so the crime that's committed are the adult males who are purchasing them. Right. You know what I'm saying? But um, it does happen to boys, um, but again, um, much less likely to have exploiters. Um, some do. Um, and then when you talked about schools, My Life, My Choice, and you talked about prevention, we have a 10-week prevention curriculum in which we go into group homes, schools, if they let us in. Because to be honest with you, schools are one of the hardest places to get into. Mm. If you don't find someone that's at the school, that works there, that kind of snuck us in the back door, so to speak, um, called it something else, but got us in. Um, and then the other thing with the 10-week curriculum, um, you can only go on for like one period, and you can't take them out of major classes. You know, I've done them like, health class time, um, and believe it or not, a lot of times kids are always trying to get out of gym, <laughs> you know, believe it or not. Um, and so the problem was with, for the youth, because our curriculum is used in 32 states across the country and in Canada, it's hard to get into schools. Um, I truly believe our curriculum works best if we can get into a middle school and get those seventh and eighth graders in, in these groups. Mm -hmm. But it's it's very, it's we already talked about that. It's like so hard. There's legislation. Everybody yeah. should support the legislation yeah. for, for universal um, sex education in schools. There's a curriculum set out. I think it's a great bill. Our young girls need, our young girls, our young boys, our young black and brown girls need to be lifted up and to know what consent means and 
what these things are and that they don't have to consent to sexual things they don't there's a lot to learn so there is there is a there is a there is a law that's pending and if there's one thing that comes out of it I'll look up the the number but anyone can look for you know Massachusetts I don't know sex ed in schools uh, Representative Jim O'Day filed it. He's filed it many, many years. He's a social worker before being a rep. And so we do need that. Yeah, and this, we'll, you know, I'll try to figure out how we can get you into our schools. Yes. So, so absolutely. Yeah. This, is, this is wonderful. Um, we definitely, well, I, everyone keeps saying, one more thing, one more thing. I have two. Pending I just think right it's, uh, now. I just, I just think it's very important. It's, 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 I know it's it all is so important, but just let me say, I'm going to say one thing. Um, Officer Tewitt has one more thing to say. We have someone here who has one more thing to say. And all of this is very important. But I just want to say that thank you so much for giving your time, energy, and coming to this very, very important forum that we are hoping that will continue to travel beyond um, Brockton. So I'm going to ask Courtney to come up because she's going to do closing remarks as we are taking 30 seconds and 30 seconds for these individuals. <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> Is it me? Yeah. Just, and, and we talked about it, we talked about Brockton diversity. Um, we haven't touched upon the non-reporting that goes on because someone feels that they're not here legally. Okay, so, and the children, something may happen to their child, but they don't want to report it because they feel if they go to police, it's going to affect their status here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to let you, there are things in place, a, a, a U visa and a T visa, I believe they're called, that if you are the victim of sexual traffic and other other crimes actually i believe that you will cover you for other crimes um, including human trafficking and if if you were there assisting and reporting law enforcement in the investigation that i believe the tvs will also help you so my point is just be aware that if you report sexual tra um, human trafficking or any type of crimes there is something set in place where it will not affect your status here. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. And, and, and your law enforcement, each police department uh, has a form that yes. we would fill out and work with you nice. to, to apply for that visa so, so it doesn't hurt you in the end. Okay. Okay. I just thought that was important. Indeed. Yes, Indeed. it is important. Yes. 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 So my question is just, um, do any of you know what the legal age of consent of marriage in the state of Massachusetts is? We've changed it to 18 years old, and we did it last session, and it's oh. a so proud, proud Thank moment. You. We've terminated the ability for anyone under 18 to be married, so we can't sell little girls into marriage in Massachusetts as of last year. As of last year. That yes. was a big one. Yes. I'm very proud of that bill we did. Yes. What is the name of that bill? Um, it, it terminated teen marriage, so it was banned teen marriage. It happened last year at the end of session. Um, Representative Kate Kahn filed that bill, and I supported it. Um, I'm really happy that that happened. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We're getting kicked out. <laughs> All right. Ready to go home. Nice to see you. I hear a lot of passion and concern. Um, in these questions. I think this is a great opportunity to continue these conversations, but I'm also a firm believer that it's great to have these conversations, but it actually takes the work and the village to make these changes. So let's let's continue this, um, this because it's very important. Some quick things though, before I, I say goodnight to you all, I would like to thank you all for, for joining us this evening. Um, I would like to encourage you to grab some information from our info table. This will give us give you all a little background on the committee and some of our upcoming events. We do have our second annual Phenomenal Women Award Brunch. Um, the nominations, is, they're open, and it's, the more information is at the back table. Please, if you know any phenomenal woman in Brockton, please consider nominating them to be recognized. We also have a suggestion form. 
And this is uh, an intentional part that I really wanted to do with our committee to hear what the community wants when it comes to programming and resources. So please take time to fill out that survey and let us know what you would like for us to do um, for some upcoming events. Lastly, but not least, I would like to thank the, the library for providing the space for us this evening. I would like to thank um, BCA for covering this event and recording it and hopefully having this shared uh, throughout the Brockton community. I would like to thank the panelists for their time and insight. And lastly, I would like to thank my committee for being such great and thoughtful planners. I wish you all a great night. Um, and I, all right. The president has said she has nothing to say. So with that being said, <laughs> good night.